So today we're going to take a look at the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And I can smile when I say this because I know that the wrath of God is going to be poured out on all his enemies, all of his enemies, so that when Jesus begins the millennial reign, there aren't any of his enemies still on the earth. No fallen angels, no watcher angels, no hybrids. Satan will be thrown into a pit. The wrath of God is what is going to usher in the millennial reign. It's going to usher in the kingdom and the day of the Lord. So like the other videos that I've done on the seals and the trumpets, there's a timeline that's associated with this that is part of this series. And I've tried to make it as basic and simple as possible so that you can understand the order of these events. Now, one of the things that it took me a while to grasp was the idea that the SEAL events, SEALs 1 through 7, have their own timeline, irrespective of the trumpets or the bowls. Every one of these seals, trumpets, and bowls has its own timeline. So a lot of people will say that you have to have all the seals first, then all the trumpets, and then all the bowls. That because this is how they show up in the book of Revelation, that necessarily means that this is how it's going to play out. But we know that Revelation is written in the Hebraic style where chronology or the order that we see events isn't necessarily how they're going to be uh, ordered in time. So there are other clues that tell us when certain events are going to happen. Uh, specifically, the seventh trumpet we know is going to be at the very end. This is when uh, Christ is going to raise the dead, change the living, reward his servants, prophets and saints, and all those who fear him, small and great. And he's going to destroy the destroyers of the earth. All really great stuff as far as I'm concerned. The bowls of wrath are just that. They are the wrath of God. The seals are not the wrath of God, and in fact, the seals aren't judgments. They are things that happen, and particularly, they are things that, um, especially seals 1 through 5, before the abomination of desolation happens, seals 1 through 4 are things that God permits, that Christ is going to permit to happen, and the fifth seal, of course, uh, the martyrdom of Christians is not part of God's wrath. Uh, so we know that that is also something that the harlot, Mystery Babylon, is going to do. So the fifth seal, martyrs, uh, will be martyred over here and brought into heaven. Also, before the time of the abomination of desolation, we know that there's going to be a rapture before any seals are opened. That's of the man-child, the 24 elders who have to be present in heaven, acting as priests before Jesus takes the scroll. And then the second rapture will be that of the 144,000 who are kept from the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. The hour of trial is right here, the sixth trumpet, that hour, day, month, and year when the harlot, Mystery Babylon, is judged. Okay, this is the first judgment of the harlot. The second one, second and final, will take place over here during the time of wrath. So once we get to the abomination of desolation, uh, pretty much most Christians are in heaven, although there are going to be some who are survivors. Christians who've been uh, born again, filled with the Spirit, who are over here, who weren't killed by the, by the harlot, are, are going to continue living over here onto the other side of the abomination of desolation. And on the same day as the sixth trumpet, second woe, there's a whole bunch of people who praise God and give him glory. These are people who later on we're going to find are what I call the God-fearers. They are going to be present during the time of the reign of the beast, that 42 months when the beast reigns. And in addition to spirit-filled Christians who are alive and survive, <laughs> there's going to be this other group of people who fear the Lord, who are going to be believers like the Old Testament uh, saints of old, who believe by faith. They weren't filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, but they trusted in Christ by faith. Here's the background for the bowls of wrath, which are going to be right here. They're going to start after the sixth and seventh seal. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit more here today. After the abomination of desolation, 
when the man of sin takes his seat in the temple of God, but before the actual visible glorious return of Christ's second coming on the Day of Atonement. This is where the seven bowls are located on a timeline. Okay, and you can see it here on, on your screen right now. Here's a screenshot of the seven bowls of wrath on a timeline. I like to always put in the abomination of desolation because so much of the events that we see taking place in Revelation are associated first with the second coming of Christ, which we know is probably going to be on the Day of Atonement. And if we subtract 1,260 days, we find the day of the abomination of desolation when the remnant of Israel flees into the wilderness. And then pretty much everything else, we can calculate where it is based on the sixth trumpet, second woe, abomination of desolation event. Before we get to the seven bowls of wrath, the, the rapture of the male child has already occurred. Uh, that's right here on the timeline. The rapture of the 144,000 has already taken place right here. The fifth seal martyrs have already been resurrected and are ministering before the throne of God. We read about that in Revelation 7, that great multitude standing before his throne. And the martyrs who are beheaded by the beast, which is over here, they are waiting for the seventh trumpet when they will be resurrected from the dead. The abomination of desolation has already taken place. And this is super important. Every fallen angel, every watcher, every hybrid, every demon, every angel bound at the river Euphrates, every single one of them is going to be on the earth by the, the time of the abomination of desolation, sixth trumpet, second woe. All present here. Uh, the dragon, Satan, the beast is going to be here, the false prophet. And this is going to be the beginning of the reign of the beast. The reign of the beast will start right here. Super important day. These two are uh, the day of atonement and the abomination of desolation are like the two most important days that are going to happen. The destruction of the harlot and uh, mystery Babylon, um, the judgment on her and the day of atonement when Christ returns in all of his glory. Two very big important days and the day of atonement over here is the most likely feast day for the Lord's return. Believers who are alive between the abomination of desolation and the day of atonement that have refused the mark and they haven't worshipped the beast and so on, they're going to actually fall into two categories like I described earlier. Uh, one group of them at, will actually have the Holy Spirit because the Spirit's going to be poured out on the day that we arrive in heaven. The day we are raptured, we see the Lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. That is part of what's going on here. People who get saved before the abomination of desolation are going to have the Holy Spirit. Anyone who gets saved after that point in time is not going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will descend again in a huge, gigantic way over the Feast of Tabernacles after Christ's return. So if you're interested in learning more about the God-fearers, that is the people who fear God and give him glory, both great and small, you can take a look at this video that I've done in the past, the prophetic patterns and the giving of the Holy Spirit on the God-fearers. Believers who have the Holy Spirit, who are alive and survive until the coming of the Lord, they, along with the God-fearers, are going to be caught up in a third rapture the one that we don't know when that's going to take place. It, we don't know when it will happen, but we do know the window of time. This particular rapture is going to happen sometime after the abomination of desolation, before the Day of Atonement, and before the, the events of the sixth and seventh seal. But we don't know when that is, okay? So this is the third rapture right here. And I've done a video on the third rapture, and it's called, Did Paul Teach a Pre-Wrath Rapture? And I hope you will look at that if you haven't seen it already, because this is where I lay out my evidence for the rapture that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, about those who are alive and survive until the coming of the Lord. His second coming is right over here. Actually, the day of the Lord begins 
when the wrath of God starts, those who are alive and survive until the coming of the Lord are going to be caught up. Okay, they're going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. Okay, and Revelation 14, 14 shows us that picture of Christ on a cloud coming to harvest the people who are here. We know they're living people because if they were dead, their, their soul would be in, in heaven already. But the only reason he needs to actually harvest them is because they're still alive. So they will be brought into heaven. That's the group that we see standing by the sea of glass mingled with fire in Revelation 15. If you haven't watched the sixth seal and the sign, I hope you'll watch that too because that's where I lay out my evidence for the placement of a sixth and the seventh seal right here after the abomination of desolation but before the second coming of christ so at the sixth seal let's just kind of recap that because it's super important because this actually begins from here on out this is the day of the lord okay also known as the millennium also known as the kingdom. And it lasts for a thousand years. It starts right here. It starts with the sixth and seventh seal. That's the sign of the coming of the Lord. So let's take a look at uh, the sixth seal again. Revelation 6, 12 through 16. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. And the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So how is it that they are able to see the face of him who's seated on the throne and the lamb. It's because when the heavens are rolled back, there is God and the sea of glass. And through that sea of glass, they can see the throne of God because that crystal sea is in front of the throne of God. And they're able to see the lamb and they can see God on his throne. Jesus speaks about this day as well. Uh, Matthew 24, 29, and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Okay, they're going to see him right here. Sixth and seventh seal. Sixth seal. Then in heaven... The seventh seal takes place. This is silence in heaven. And the seventh seal, once it, it's fully opened on that scroll that's had seven seals on it, and Christ is the one who's worthy to open that scroll, what happens is the judgment of God is coming. The judgment of God is coming once that seventh seal is broken. How do I know it's judgment? How do I know that that seal is all about the judgment of God? Because whatever happened after we read the seventh seal, this is what the, the scroll is all about. The day of judgment is about to begin. The great day of the Lord has arrived. It's the start of a new age when Christ will be king over all the earth. And we're going to take a look at some verses about silence and judgment here in just a minute. But what I'd like to do is just remind you that God is going to prepare the world for the kingdom, for Christ's reign. And the way he prepares the world for that is by cleansing the earth of all of the fallen entities that have infested the world for 42 months. During the reign of the beast, when Satan, the dragon, is like God the Father, and the beast is like God the Son, and you've got the false prophet, like the Holy Spirit, and you've got all the 
those who are in the image of the beach, beast. These are hybrids. These are fallen angel spirits who've indwelt the bodies of earth dwellers, of, you know, hybrids. You've got all of these fallen ones, and when Jesus starts his millennial reign, none of these entities are going to be on the earth to disrupt what he's doing on the earth, to disrupt his rule, his reign, to infest anybody, to inhabit anyone. All that is over. That will be a thing of the past. This will never, ever, ever happen again. Okay, so when we talk about the days of Noah, what we're talking about is not an increase in violence and wickedness or really anything like that. What we're talking about is it the invasion, the four wave invasion of fallen entities on the earth. So let's take a look at Revelation 15, verse 1, and then 5 through 8. This is actually the preparation for when the bulls are going to be poured out. Then I saw another sign in heaven, and by the way, this is the third sign. The first one was the Revelation 12, 1 and 2 sign, sign of the woman in the starry heavens. The second sign is the sign of the dragon, uh, that first incursion of fallen entities, uh, the uh, travail of the woman that is this uh, ever-increasing war in Israel, plus the change of the male child, the, uh, the birth of the male child when uh, we as believers become immortal, and then before the child can be presented to God, there's seven days that have to pass, and then on the eighth day, he can be presented to God, and that's that's how that works. So that is the second sign. The third sign is here. It's a sign that's in heaven. It's a sign that's in heaven. There is going to be a sign on the earth for people on the earth. That is the events of the sixth seal, which Gospel of Matthew 24, Jesus calls this the sign of his coming for people on earth. For people in heaven, there is going to be a, a different sign. Let's pick up at verse 5. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So the presentation of the seven bowls of the wrath of God is awesome. It's frightening and it's majestic. It's happening in heaven. And one of the living creatures gives these bowls to those seven bright and glorious angels. And the temple in heaven is filled with smoke and glory. And just like we read about in the Old Testament passages, no one, no priest can stand to minister. No angel speaks or sings. It's silence. No one is glorifying God. This is probably the first time in all of God's history since the creation of the heavens and the earth that there has been no sound in heaven. There's absolute and total silence throughout heaven because silence precedes judgment. Zephaniah 1.7 Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. Zechariah 2.13 Be silent before the Lord, all people, for he's roused himself from his holy dwelling. Second Chronicles 5.13b and 14 And the temple, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand there to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
Chapter 15, verse 8 tells us that no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And then once we get to Revelation chapter 11 and we read about the seventh trumpet, we read that the temple in heaven is opened. So once the seventh trumpet blows, the, the temple in heaven will be open for ministry once more. Revelation 16 now is going to give us the details of the seven bowls of wrath. And it's important to understand that this wrath, again, is not poured out on just anybody. It's not just any human being who happens to be on the earth. It's going to be on people who take the mark of the beast or worship the beast or worship its image. It's going to be on the beast and the beast kingdom. Okay, it's going to be on God's enemies. It's not on just the rank and file of humanity. That is, that is never described in Revelation. There are people, so-called, who are going to be on the earth during that time that are going to experience the wrath of God. It's people who do not give God glory, and it's going to be all those who dwell on earth. And from what we understand about all those who dwell on earth, the earth dwellers, these are not actual people. These are hybrids. These are entities who never had their name written in the book of life. And the book of life, uh, first mention of it is in Genesis 5, where we read about the generations of Adam who came from God. And then right away in Genesis 6, we read about another group of people whose names were never in the book of life. And these are what we call the Nephilim or the giants. They're the half-breeds, the, the hybrids. The seven bowls of wrath are poured out on God's spiritual enemies. The first bowl is harmful and painful sores that are on people who bear the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second bowl is sort of similar to the trumpet events where the sea becomes like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel, again, this is sort of similar to what we read about in the trumpet events, the rivers and the springs of water, that is the fresh water, became like blood. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. And they were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues, and they did not repent or give him glory. So there are people who repent and give God glory uh, throughout the last part of the book of Revelation, and then there are these ones who do not do that. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, you'll remember that at the sixth trumpet, uh, there are four angels bound at the river Euphrates who are released for this hour, day, month, and year to destroy the third of mankind. And that's the angels that come out of uh, the Euphrates River. But once you get over here to the seven bulls, this is when the Euphrates River actually dries up so that the kings who are east of the Euphrates River, and we're talking Asia here, and you know China and probably India and so on, and Muslim countries, and, and, and all the kings who have been a part of the kingdom of the beast, they are going to cross the Euphrates River. And so the only thing that I can think of, even though the Euphrates is looking pretty dry right now, I think that by the time these events take place, the, the Euphrates River will actually be full and something is going to happen so that that river dries up really quickly, kind of like overnight. Verse 13, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Here we have that great day, the great day of his wrath, the great day of the Lord, the great day of Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments 
that he may not go about naked, be seen exposed. This is a this is a, an exhortation to believers who are living here to be awake because once these things start, they want to be ready and go at a moment's notice. In a minute, we're going to go into a little bit more about these demons, spirits that are being sent out here. But let's keep reading uh, verse 16. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And the seventh angel poured his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. We're talking about the wrath here. The wrath of God is going to be over. In Revelation chapter 15, we read about the seven angels with the seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And then once we get to the seventh bowl, we see that they are, it is indeed finished. Okay, it is done. And there were flashings and lightnings and rumblings and peals of thunder and a great earthquake. And I've done videos on the location on a timeline of when the Revelation earthquakes all take place. They are easily assigned a location on a timeline. And the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of hail, because the plague was so severe. So you'll notice that the wrath of God is directed toward the beast, the beast kingdom, the armies that join the beast, the cities that are part of Babylon that will still be in existence, although they aren't going to be calling the shots or running the show. There is going to be a remnant of people who survive this uh, sixth trumpet judgment of the harlot. There's, there are survivors from that who don't give up worshiping their gods of gold and silver and stone and so on. And again, I'm just going to emphasize that this wrath is not directed to non-believers in general, but to those who sided with the beast. The wrath does not begin until the first of the seven angels begins to pour out his bowls, and then the wrath will end when we hear the voice that says, it is done. So around the time of the sixth bowl, okay, this is the drying up of the river Euphrates, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are going to have this task of luring all the fearful armies, the fearful kings, out of their bunkers and caves. How do I know that? Well, I know that because right here at the sixth and seventh seal, as soon as they saw God the Father in heaven and the Lamb, they went into their underground bunkers and <laughs> they went underground. And that's where they are. They're underground. And so the dragon and the beast and the false prophet are going to have to lure them out. They're going to have to try to uh, get them assembled so that when Christ comes, they can actually defeat him. If they can't hold the earth, okay, if they can't hold the earth, the only place they can go is into the lake of fire. They know that that's their destiny unless they can maintain their hold on the earth. So what kinds of deceptions are these lying spirits, these demonic spirits, deceiving spirits going to use? What kind of deception is it? Well, we can only really speculate. We can, we can kind of guess about it. But I think that it's very possible that they will remind these people of the victory that they had over millions of believers and the two witnesses back here. Remember when the harlot killed and put to death, became drunk on the blood of the saints, millions and millions of people cannot be counted over here, okay? And remember, the two witnesses are going to be here also, and they're going to survive up until they can kill the beast on Passover. The beast, however, is going to rise from the dead on first fruits, which will be day 1260 for the two witnesses. The beast will turn around and kill them. This is going to look like evil is triumphing over good from our perspective, but from the perspective of the fallen angels, it's going to look like the beast is the hero and the savior because he was able to conquer the two witnesses. All right. So... The other thing we know is that the false prophet is able to make fire come down from heaven. 
so I have a feeling that these uh, demonic spirits are going to go out and remind these um, people and entities and so on who are in the bunkers that they were winners before and that they can do this. They can come up against Jesus when he returns. So there's an Old Testament story. Okay, remember there's all these allusions and Old Testament references in Revelation. So let's take a look at this Old Testament story. And I think it's in either First or Second Chronicles 18, 18 through 21. And this is a story about how God okayed having a lying spirit go into the mouths of the prophets to lure King Ahab into going into battle against the people of Ramoth Gilead. So this prophet Micaiah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. And now he's going to describe something he saw in heaven. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right and his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, to march up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one suggested this and another that. And then a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means? asked the Lord. And he replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. You will surely entice him and prevail, said the Lord. Go and do it. And this is, I believe, the Old Testament illusion that is referring to what's going to happen during the end times when these uh, spirits are going to go out and convince people, convince armies and kings and all of God's enemies, the fallen ones too, that they can be gathered together and win the day that they can gather together at Armageddon and beat the Lord. Now, bits and pieces of what's going to happen at the return of Christ sort of appear all over the book of Revelation. They're not just in Revelation 19, which is the one people tend to point to when Christ, uh, the heavens are opened and Christ comes out of heaven. Revelation chapter 1 has a second coming of Christ passage. We read about it in 14 as well and in 17 and you know 19. And so there's a lot of bits and pieces of the second coming of Christ that are scattered throughout the book of Revelation. And this is one of the reasons why we know that you cannot just read Revelation chronologically because you're going to bump up against these second coming passages and it's going to be confusing and you don't know to place them, you know, kind of at the end here at his coming or as part of one of the bowls. So let's look at a couple of these uh, second coming um, uh, bold judgment, uh, bowls of wrath, passages in Revelation. Revelation 14, verses 17 through 20. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, the angel who has authority over fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Okay, so a couple things that we learn here is this is the whole blood flowing in uh, like... Um, as a wine press, and this is the wine press of the wrath of God. And I just want to highlight this, okay? This is all wrath here. This is the wrath of God. It starts with the first bowl, it ends with the seventh bowl. And with these, the wrath of God is done, it's over. Armageddon actually comes from two um, words, har, which means mountain, and the Megiddo part of it just means assembly. So the Mount of Assembly. This is actually um, Jerusalem. This is not uh, the Valley of Megiddo. I don't believe that it's the place that most people assign for the Battle of Armageddon. It's actually going to be outside the city of Jerusalem. And then Revelation 19, uh, beginning with verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. 
His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And then here's the, the verse that I think is a key verse here. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Christ's return as King of Kings will most likely be on the Day of Atonement. Remember, we see heaven opened. And on the that particular feast day, the Day of Atonement, is the day that's associated with an open heaven. This is when um, God and man met together. So either So God came down basically to the inner sanctuary where the ark was and a priest could go in and meet with the Lord and I believe that the day of the transfiguration of Christ and the day of his baptism were both on the day of atonement when a voice from heaven you know heavens opened and a dove came down and the, this voice from heaven said this is my beloved son um, so there you go so it's on this day of atonement that Christ is going to exit the heavenly temple, just like on the day of atonement in the earthly tabernacle when the high priest came out of the temple, that was when the forgiveness of sins for the nation of Israel took place. So it's on this same day, the day that Christ returns, the day of atonement, that the sins of the nation of Israel will be wiped away. Zechariah 12 verses 10 and 11 and 13 verse 1. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And on that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. It's such a good story. I just love the story. It's just wonderful. And when you know how to put all the prophetic pieces together, you can see how you get all the various elements of this time period having to do with the return of Christ, the wrath of God, the beginning of the day of the Lord, how God is going to clean up um, the world from these fallen ones so that when Christ begins to reign, it's, you know, it's going to be wonderful and glorious. We also see how at the second coming of Christ, this is when Christ exits the heavenly temple as the one who is both the priest and the sacrifice for the nation of Israel. And on a single day, their sins will be removed from them when they see him whom they have pierced. Then there's going to be um, like five days or so between the Day of Atonement and the Day of the Seventh Trumpet. And the Seventh Trumpet is going to be on the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is a feast that is going to be celebrated every year during the millennium. This is the official day when Christ, uh, the official celebration for the inauguration of the Kingdom of God on the earth. So. Uh, let me know what you think. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, we'll see you on another one. Till then, have a blessed day.